Next, it is my privilege to introduce our plenary speaker for this evening. The Reverend Dr. John Stone Street serves as president of the Colson Center. He is a sought after author and speaker on areas of faith and culture, theology, worldview, education, and apologetics. John is the daily voice of Breakpoint, the nationally syndicated commentary on the culture founded by the late Chuck Colson. He is also the voice of The Point, a daily one minute feature on worldview, apologetics, and cultural issues. Before coming to the Colson Center in 2010, John served in various leadership capacities with Summit Ministries and was on the Biblical Studies faculty at Bryan College. John has co-authored a number of books. He holds degrees from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and Bryan College. He and his wife, Sarah, have four children and they live in Colorado Springs. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. John Stone Street. Good evening. Thank you for that warm welcome. I've got to say of all the welcomes I've ever had, that one is by far the most recent, and so I'm grateful for it. Uh, I also want to say thank you for that kind introduction. I just got a promotion. I'm now a doctor, and that was a lot easier than doing a dissertation, so thank you. I'm, I'm, I have to, I'm not a doctor. Um, I, I was offered an honorary doctorate once, but then they changed their minds. It was, it, it, it was messy. It's an obligation whenever someone speaks to say that they are honored to be here, but this time I really mean it. I am honored to be a part of this gathering. Uh, Archbishop Foley, thank you so much for the honor of this invitation. Uh, and I uh, just acknowledge uh, that uh, it is an honor to be a part of this. And I thank you for your long service to, to ACNA and uh, Archbishop-elect Wood, it's, 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 I look forward to your leadership as well. Uh, I am a deacon in the ACNA. Uh, I serve at St. George's Church in Colorado Springs uh, under Bishop Felix Orgy and uh, Father Don Armstrong. Um, okay, three claps, that's fine. I'll, <laughs> uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll tell them more of you claps for them. Uh, but it is, uh, it is great to, to be here, and I am here, in, 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 I guess, in somewhat of a dual capacity, uh, both as a, a member of this uh, communion and also uh, the, the, the president of an organization um, that believes deeply in the church. Um, I hope the name Chuck Colson rings a bell for, for many of us here. It's, it's my privilege to serve as the president of the Colson Center. As you know, Chuck Colson was known for having uh, Amber Alert. Is that what that is going off here? Not a tornado alert. We're good. It is a tornado alert. That's not it. Okay. Just somebody tell me if we need to worry. Um, Chuck Colson, of course, is known for having basically uh, three public lives. The first was as Nixon's hatchet man. Uh, he was part of the Watergate scandal. Ended up going to prison uh, for his involvement in the Watergate scandal. But just prior to that, God had different plans. And uh, he became a Christian. And a remarkable story, uh, if you've never read the conversion of Chuck Colson, you should. Uh, some of you remember it, probably. Uh, I'm not old enough to remember it, but it is one of those just really remarkable things. Uh, leading an organization, a nonprofit organization, uh, sometimes you just kind of hope that there's nothing in the past of your organization or anything like that that um, could cause problems. We know that there's been too many failures and public falls in recent years, and I often tell people I'm, I have no worry whatsoever that, that Chuck would have a, a public failing, and one of them responded, well, he did, but it was before Jesus. So the moral of the story is um, if you're going to have a big public disgraceful fall, do it before Jesus. And uh, Chuck was one of those remarkable public salvations. Um, and he ended up going to prison as part of Watergate. That's where a lot of his early discipleship took place. And he left prison and went back to prison. And he kept going back to prison over and over and over, having started what became the largest prison ministry in the world, uh, Prison Fellowship. Some of you have participated in various initiatives of Prison Fellowship, Angel Tree, and other things. And I thank you for that. The third part of his life, though, was, grew out of actually uh, seeing uh, something emerge in American culture. And it's something, of course, that we now have, uh, it, it, it's our calling to be on the tail end of what he saw early on. Uh, 
but Chuck was growing uh, prison fellowship ministries at a time when the prison population in America was absolutely exploding. And academics and sociologists would try to explain it. And the typical explanations had something to do with poverty or, or, or racism or the lack of education or lack of upward mobility or some of these social factors. And Chuck didn't believe that those explanations went nearly far enough to explain what really was at the heart. And when I say the explosion of the prison population, I remember Chuck Colson saying this near the end of his life. This would have been around 2010. He said, you know, when I was incarcerated, and that would have been, you know, back in the 70s, there were 200,000 prisoners in America. And today, like I said, that's 2010. He said there were 2.2 million. What could explain the explosive growth? And what, what Chuck understood is that the brokenness that he was seeing in the prisons wasn't the root of the problem, it was the fruit of a deeper problem. And if you go upstream, there was a brokenness in society. And as a student of church history, as a, someone who loved deeply theology and ecumenism, uh, ecumenism and, and, and I think around the truth, he, he, he really worked very, very uh, uh, hard to answer that question first and foremost theologically. And what he realized is, is that the brokenness that he was seeing in the prisons was the result of a brokenness that he was seeing upstream in the culture. And the second thing that he realized studying church history is that the church was always at its best, not when it was running away from culture, but when it was running into culture. The church is at its best, not when it's running away from the plague, but when it's running into the plague. Not when it's running away from the brokenness, but running into the brokenness. That there actually is a responsibility of the church to be in the world. And that led him into the study of Christian worldview. That led him to start the Breakpoint radio program. Some of you might remember that. We continue to carry that, uh, br uh, that program on on podcasts and other places, talking about what's happening in culture from a Christian uh, set of fundamental categories about life in the world, what might be called a, a, a Christian worldview. And that's what Chuck championed. Um, Chuck died in, in 2012, and I've had the privilege of leading the Colson Center since 2016. And in that time, even in that time, the speed at which the world around us has deeply changed has been just almost too much to bear, hasn't it? Anybody else here just a little bit dizzy by how quickly things went from being unthinkable to unquestionable, like overnight? How do you even keep up with what's going on? What's your responsibility as someone leading a congregation and working with parents who have children and children who have grandparents and the generation gap between them is, is more stark than it's ever been? How do we think well about the world that we, we're in? As, uh, when, when I got the gracious invitation to be a part of this event, I, I was told that the theme of the assembly here was prayer, which is a very appropriate thing in light of uh, uh, the, the decisions that were made by the College of Bishops, uh, the new election of, uh, of, of Stephen Wood, um, the various things that are happening in the world and, and, and the challenges that, that, that we face. Um, prayer is an appropriate theme. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I believe in prayer. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> um, but I don't know much how to teach on it. Um, it, it but, th but then I thought, you know, I think one of the most neglected prayers in the Bible, maybe one that's worth looking at and spending a little bit of time on in light of the cultural moment that we find ourselves in, is the prayer of Jesus. Um, now, we know uh, that uh, our, 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 our services and our churches elevate and give priority, and rightfully so, to the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray, and we should do that as often as possible. But in John chapter 17, we have the prayer that Jesus prayed. And I think, you know, maybe other than the prayer of Jabez, it could be considered. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, <laughs> Some of you got that joke. I appreciate that. No, I think a, a, a pretty strong case can be made that this is the most significant prayer in all of Holy Scripture. I mean, think about it. Jesus is talking to his disciples for the very last time. If you've never read John 17 in the context of John 16, it's, it's really notable. The sort of things that he's telling them in John 16, and then he just basically stops and prays for them. And then, of course, we remember that this is a prayer that is 
Essentially, God the Son talking to God the Father on the evening before the central event in all of human history. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable prayer. And everything that Jesus prays serves the purposes that he opens the prayer with. If you uh, have uh, your Bibles, you can turn to John 17 or your smartphones or whatever you read the scriptures on these days. John 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has, has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now think about it. Everything that Jesus is about to pray serves the purposes that he introduces in these first few verses. He prays that people would know him because by knowing him, they would have eternal life. And by knowing him, that would bring the son glory. And by bringing the son glory, that would bring the father glory. And of course, that's the purposes of everything that God has created. So Jesus is praying for nothing less than the fulfillment of God's eternal purposes from the beginning of time throughout all of eternity. And it would take too long to, to, to really dive deep into all the different things that get brought out of this prayer and the various ways that we are to know him and to have life and therefore to glorify the Son and therefore to glorify the Father and to fulfill the eternal purposes of all things. But there's just two things here that I found to be almost odd that Jesus prayed for. In the context of fulfilling God's full, uh, eternal purposes, there, there are two things that he prays for here that just seem strange. The first thing that he prays for that I found to be strange is, is, is when he says, Father, I'm not praying for the world. I don't pray for the world. I'm praying for the ones that you have given me. What an interesting thing for Jesus to say. We know that what is going to be accomplished the, 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 the next few days after this prayer, through the passion, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is going to bring salvation to the whole world. But he doesn't pray for salvation to the whole world. What he prays for is that his followers would fulfill their purpose. I, I, I go back so many times to different things that Chuck Colson said. Every time I think I've come up with something really smart, I realize I'm just plagiarizing Chuck or J.I. Packer or something like that. The thing that I've come back to over the last three or four years, over and over and over, as a mark of, I think, deep wisdom, as God was leading Chuck to lead our organization, is he said this. He said, what the world needs most right now is for the church to be the church. Think about it. The world's going to be the world. That shouldn't surprise us. We shouldn't be caught off guard when sinners sin and the lost are lost and, and, and so on. What Chuck realized is that the church was always at its best when it was living as the church in the context of, 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 of the culture. What the world needs most is for the church to be the church. You know, he said that now he's been dead for over 10 years, but I look back at the wisdom of that and I think it's more true now than it was when he said it. What our world needs most right now is for the church to be the church. And that's precisely what Jesus prayed, that the church would be the church in the context of the world that was going to persecute them, that was going to oppress them, mock them, give them all kinds of trouble. The key was the church being the church. Now, of course, that, that brings up a, a question. What does it mean for the 
church to be the church. Sorry, did I say something wrong? (laughs) And this brings up the second somewhat odd thing that Jesus prays for here in this high priestly prayer that's recorded in John chapter 17. I I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a a home with parents that, that loved Jesus. And they introduced me to Jesus at a very young age. We went to church. Uh, The church also had a Christian school. So I was in a Christian community six days out of the week, uh, every week. (laughs) It's true, I'm telling you, it's true. Uh, Six days out of the week, every week uh, for my entire growing up years. Um, It was actually one of those interesting little places where uh, the church and the school were very much mixed together. So I wasn't always sure who my third grade teacher was and who my Sunday school teacher was, because sometimes it was the same person. My basketball coach was my youth pastor. The assistant pastor was the principal. You know, I I think, you know, Ray Stevens sang a song about this. Um, It it just was this really, (laughs) thanks, I appreciate that. He, He liked it. Um, It was just this strange kind of small little uh, community in which uh, I I was raised. And when you're raised Christian your whole life, and it wasn't a place that was necessarily friendly uh, to asking tough questions, um, questions about the truthfulness of Christianity, questions that maybe created, you know, chagrin in your heart and mind. And and, and, and there was various questions that I I felt like I, I didn't really get answered. One of those questions was a question that I I started asking um, really when I was in elementary school because very early uh, I got the distinct impression and and some of this was the way that the faith was presented to us, some of this was how I interpreted it, but I got the distinct impression that Christianity was fundamentally about um, going to heaven and not going to hell. And, and so you want to be a Christian so that you go to heaven and not go to hell. And that seemed like a pretty reasonable decision to make. And so that was the decision that, that I made. But then you start wondering, well, if that's the point, if the whole point of this whole thing is to uh, go to heaven and not go to hell, then why is it that the moment that we become Christians, we're not immediately taken to heaven? That was the question, one of the questions that bothered me. Can anyone else relate to this? Did that bother any? Thank you, there's seven of us that had that struggle. I really struggled with that. Why, why am I still here? And, um, uh, you know, and I, I wrestled with that and I thought, you know, if I could just go to heaven right away, then I wouldn't sin and I wouldn't struggle with that person who made me sin, which at the time was my sister. And, you know, we, you know, we, could, just, we could just move on. And, and then I hit puberty and then I was like, well, maybe not yet. And um, Um, You know, and and, and this was a real question. Imagine my surprise years later when I found out the answer to that question. Why doesn't God just take us to heaven immediately uh, when we trust Christ and become Christians? And the answer is it's Jesus' fault. Because in John 17, he actually prays against that. He talks about not praying for the world and praying for the church. He talks about how hard it's going to be in the world. But he then says, Father, I'm not praying, in verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now remember, this is being prayed in the context of those words that we prayed earlier. In other words, somehow being in the world not being taken from it has something to do with us knowing Christ. And by knowing Christ, we have eternal life. That is eternal life, he says. And by having life, that glorifies the Son, which glorifies the Father, which is the ultimate purpose of everything that was ever made to begin with. In other words, Christians belong in this time and in this place. This is a theme that's actually developed all the way throughout Scripture, not just in Jesus' high priestly prayer. Throughout Scripture, one of the things that God reveals about himself is that he is a God of chronological precision, you might say. He is a God of precise time and precise place. You see this in Galatians chapter 4 when uh, when Paul actually writes that at just the right time and just the right place, Christ enters. And it's interesting to read some of the folks, for example, uh, Philip Schmidt, 
Schmidt, who wrote a history on this, that just the, the, the precision historically of Jesus entering that part of the world at that time in human history it can, can actually be uh, credited to some degree with the spread of Christianity around the world in ways that were completely, completely unexpected. I think a, a, a more interesting place where we see something maybe more explicit about the precision of God and, and choosing time and, and, and place is found in another 17, a book later, Acts chapter 17. Here Paul is, uh, is speaking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens. And uh, it's interesting that Luke actually mentions that the people that he are talking to are Epicureans and Stoics, because if you actually look at what Paul says there in engaging them and introducing uh, them to Christ, uh, he, he introduces introduces some things that are really aimed at Epicureanism and Stoicism. One of the things uh, that we know about Epicureans and Stoics, for example, is that they had a very uh, different ideas about the relationship of the gods with time and place. Uh, the Epicureans believed that the gods had created the world and had lost interest and had just moved on. And so this is where we get that phrase that Solomon, uh, Epicureanism is where we get that phrase that Solomon wrote about in Ecclesiastes and Dave Matthews wrote a song about centuries later, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. In other words, the gods aren't paying attention, no one's paying attention, and so we can do whatever we want. The Stoics, of course, had a very, very different view of that relationship of the gods in time and place. They believed that the gods determined every single aspect of time and place, so that free will itself was an illusion. So it's to the Epicureans and the Stoics to which Paul is, is speaking there in Athens, and here's what he says, uh, somewhere around verse 24-ish of Acts chapter 17. He says that the God who created everything does not live in temples made by human hands, nor can we actually do anything to help him. But here's what he did. He created all of us, every race from, one, from, from a single man. And he determined, Paul says, the exact times in which we live in the boundaries of our dwelling place. Isn't that a remarkable thing to say? that God specifically determined that we would find ourselves in this time and place, and he also determined that we would not be in another time and place. In other words, the cultural context in which we live is not just an accidental part of what it means to do church in the world. The specifics of the cultural challenges that we find ourselves in are not just accidental things by which we have to figure out what it means for the church to be the church. It actually is a calling from God. We have been called to a particular time and to a particular place. Another way to think about this, and I think the Jesus' high priestly prayer actually, uh, I think really answers this in a profound way. But if you go back to the struggle that I had as a, as a, as a young kid growing up in a Christian home, the, the heart of the struggle was a, a struggle of questions. Uh, we spend a lot of time, I think, as followers of Jesus asking, what are we saved from? And of course, the answer is remarkable. We're saved from sin. We're saved from the consequences of sin. We're saved from death. And if that's all there were to salvation, what we're saved from, you should take that deal because it's the best deal that you'll get today. You know, I mean, that is a wonderful gift from, from, from God. Maybe we talk a little bit about what we're saved to. We're saved to eternal life. We're saved to an eternal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's remarkable as well. But I think to some degree, this odd part of Jesus's prayer, when he says, Father, do not take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one, is that starts giving us an answer to a different question, not just what we're saved from and what we're saved to, but maybe a question that's a little bit harder, and that is what, are, what, what is our salvation for? If we're supposed to know what it means for the church to be the church, there's a helpful framework that we can apply. It's the four framework. I got this from a wonderful author named T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, in an article years ago, 
uh, in what's called the, in an article he wrote called The Aims of Education, he, he, he provides this framework. And he says, you know, whenever uh, we see something new, a new and mysterious machine, he said, there's two questions really that come to mind. Uh, what can I do with this thing? And what is this thing for? And he said, before we know what to do with a thing, we need to know what a thing is for. Imagine, for example, I'll just illustrate his, his point. If I came across a laptop, and I've never seen a laptop before, and I think to myself, what can I do with this thing? Or what can this thing do? And, and, and I just, oh, it opens and closes. I know what I can do with this thing. I can have a puppet show. Now, can you have a puppet show with a laptop? I've never tried it, but theoretically, uh, the answer is yes, but at that point you would be dramatically underutilizing the laptop, unless it was a Dell, but that's different. <laughs> or let's say I came across a, a, a laptop, a, a MacBook Air, small, thin, and I think, what can I do with this thing? I know what I can do. I could skip this across the lake. Now, I've never tried to skip a MacBook Air across the lake. Uh, but, but theoretically, it could be done. But at this point, you're not only underutilizing the laptop, you're actually going to do something that destroys it. So before we know what to do with something, we need to know what something is what? For. What is our salvation for? And this prayer answers that question, this strange part of Jesus' prayer for the disciples and for us answers that question to some degree. It kind of, here's how I think it answers it. Whatever it is that our salvation is for, based on this prayer, it's not for escape. We're not saved to escape the challenges of this world. There are escapist religions. There are religions that are from top to bottom escapists, and I'm not being disparaging to these religions, but they're actually escapist in and of themselves. Hinduism is an escapist religion. The point of Hinduism is through a cycle of births and rebirths to finally escape that cycle and, 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 and once again become one with, with everything. It's an escapist. The goal of Hinduism is to escape physical existence. Buddhism is an escapist religion. In Buddhism, you don't escape necessarily through births and rebirths. You escape through, 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 through uh, be, being able to settle at a place in your mind where you can once again enter this kind of place of contentment with no desire and no suffering. Buddhism is an escapist religion. Oprahism is an escapist religion. You know, that's just kind of the best way to identify kind of the, kind of the new agey sort of ignore the really tough things, focus on the positive, you know, kind of positive thinking sorts of ways of thinking about uh, life in the world that characterizes kind of pop American religion. And unfortunately, some forms of pop American Christianity. But Christianity is not an escapist religion. And it's not just because Jesus prayed, Father, do not take them out of the world. It's because Christianity is centered around the person of Christ. And the person of Christ is actually the ultimate person who did not escape. Our faith is an incarnational one. If you think about it from the entire narrative of Scripture, the entire narrative of Scripture tells the story of a God who not only created the world, but who actually continued to come and visit the world. His trajectory, God's trajectory, according to Holy Scripture from the beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, from the, new, from the creation of heavens and earth to the new heavens and new earth, the trajectory of God is toward the world he had made, not leaving the world he had made. From the very beginning, he comes down and walks with Adam and Eve. He comes down and deals personally with them in their sin. He comes down and walks with Enoch. He comes down and calls the patriarchs by name. He comes down on a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. He comes down and personally leads the Israelites out of uh, uh, Egypt. He comes down and embodies the tabernacle. He comes down and embodies the, the temple. He comes down in the word of the prophets. And we know, as Paul wrote, that the fullness of the Godhead was in bodily form in Christ Jesus. He fully comes down in Christ Jesus. And even when Christ ascends, 
He says, it's good that I go away. This is the previous chapters from what we've read in John 14 and chapter 15 and so on. Jesus says, it's good that I go away because if I go away, I'm going to come down. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And that's the trajectory from the beginning of Scripture all the way to the end. In fact, the only time in all of Holy Scripture that God stops visiting the world that he made and the people in his image is in the new heavens and new earth. And that's because he moves. Heaven comes down to earth and Christ makes, and God makes his dwelling among men. It's an amazing, amazing story. The trajectory of the Bible was not escapist. Unfortunately, the trajectory of the church is often escapist. The trajectory of the church is to see the chaos and the culture around us and not want to touch too many things because it becomes really difficult. At this point, I would be irresponsible if I did not make a call to this church body of which I am part. The Anglican Church in North America cannot be an escapist church. Not only because Christ does not give us that option, which he does not, but you have to understand the people in the pews, in your congregations, in this confusing culture right now are absolutely lost. There is no voice of reason. There is no voice of truth. There is no voice of reality other than the church of Christ right now. If we do not give them direction, they will not have it. We must not be silent. And unfortunately, there are too many Christian voices that are willing to speak out on issues of culture that culture has already decided for us. But when it comes to the hard ones, we know what we're talking about. We're talking about the issues of sexuality and human identity. Church, if if you do not provide clarity on these issues, you have a congregation that is destined to be brainwashed and lost. I fully understand what happens when you stick your neck out. I fully understand what happens when you stand up for the way that God designed human beings made in his image, male and female. I just gotta tell you, I, I hear from these parents. I talk to these kids. They are being harassed and bullied by bad ideas. They are being brainwashed. They are being harmed. You may know the saying, ideas have consequences. What that means is that ideas about what it means to be human, ideas about truth, ideas about morality don't just stay in textbooks and philosophy, works of philosophy. They actually grow feet and walk out into the real world and they affect real people's lives. And that's why we often add at the Colson Center, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. What Chuck Colson realized is that the church was at its best when it was running toward the victims, not away from them. Yes, there are victims of poverty in our culture. There are victims of discrimination. There are victims of depression, of addiction, of suicidality, and I hope we're speaking to all of those. But our culture's worst ideas right now are ideas about what it means to be human. And here's what you need to know. The church has the best answer in the marketplace of ideas on that one. 
We don't have to be ashamed on this. The first chapters of Holy Scripture say that God created humans in his what? Image. Chuck Colson would say that that is the most significant idea that Christianity ever gave to the wider world. Other than the salvation message of just how to be right with God. Why? Because if you look at the idea of the image of God, it, is, it might be the most consequential idea on a civilizational level in human history. Think about what our founders wrote. We hold these truths to be that all men are created equal. Now, of course, at the time that they wrote it, it wasn't true in the American context. It hadn't been lived out yet. It was an ideal. It was an aspiration. But think about the ideal itself to which we were being called as a new nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all, is it self-evident that we're all equal? Look around real quick, look at each other. Is it self-evident that we're the same? Look again. <laughs> when you look around, the first thing that comes to mind is not that we're the same. The first thing that comes to mind is we are all what? Different. So what on earth could our founders have possibly meant? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. Well, it can't be based on anything we share on the outside. It's not self-evident that we share anything on the outside. Some of us are taller than others. Some of us are older than others. Some of us are, are this skin color or that skin color. Some of us are male. Some of us are female. It's not obvious that we share anything at all on the outside. So it can't be something we share on the outside. It has to be something we share on the inside. It has to be an intrinsic identity of who we are. And the only religion that has given an answer to is what it means to be human that everyone shares, that's not based on ethnicity, that's not based on nationality, that's not based on ability, that's not based on race, that's not based on gender, it's not based on any of those things. It's Christianity, this idea that humans are made in the image and likeness of God. And the image of God is crucial to understanding the Bible. So not only is it a consequential idea in history, it's a crucial idea to Holy Scripture. The story of Holy Scripture is that God ultimately becomes the one he created in his image. So what that means and the role that that plays throughout Holy Scripture, the story of creation and new creation is absolutely vital. It's also a critical idea for our cultural moment to understand what it means to be made in the image of God is at the root of so many things that we are wrestling with. From what is the moral status of the preborn, which of course has shaped the dialogue and the debate around the issue of abortion. But not only that, if we're not clear about what it means to be human, we're not gonna be clear on how to actually talk to our young marrieds about artificial reproductive technologies and the potential ethical challenges of things like in vitro fertilization. An industry that has now put over a million little children in freezers destined to actually be eliminated, medically tested on, or discarded just in the United States. It's a human rights crisis of epic proportions. I wonder how many young marrieds go to their churches and ask for premarital counseling and get the sort of ethical considerations that they need to make the good decisions if they face the tragedy of infertility. Yeah, this is an escapist posture that the church has largely taken to the most significant and controversial issues of our day. We can't continue to do that. There may have been a day when if the church didn't say it, good news, the rest of the culture largely agreed with the moral conclusions that we had. That day has long passed. We can't even see that day from here. It's one thing to live in a cultural moment 
that agree, where everyone agrees on where we're trying to get to. We just disagree on how to get there. It's a completely different thing when we live in a culture where some call up, up, and other call up, down, and we confuse black and white and left and, and, and right and, and, and right and wrong and male and female. I mean, we, we have our cat, we, we don't even agree on the world that we're talking about. The church has to speak into the challenges of the cultural moment if we are going to fulfill the prayer that Jesus prayed, that his people would not be taken out of the world but protected from the evil one. We can also say here that our salvation is not for escape, and also we could say that our salvation is not for accommodation. What I mean by accommodation is uh, basically taking the posture of uh, embracing what's happening uh, in our culture and some of the categories and some of the language and some of the lines of reasoning. One of the things that I pray for a lot for our church body, for our assembly, is what many of us have understood to be the elephant in the room when we all get together. We have significant differences when it comes to questions of ordination, specifically the ordination of women to the priesthood. And it's a hard question. I I don't know that I have any sort of answers Certainly not one I'm willing to put my neck out on at this moment. (laughs) But we have to look around and see that we're not the only Christian denomination right now struggling with this. This question's being asked in the SBC, it's being asked elsewhere. There is a lesson that we can learn from history, however. In the last hundred years or so, there have been two Christian groups that have pushed forward with changing the historic posture of the church on women's ordination. One has been the mainline denominations, the United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church, other churches, uh, the United Methodist Church, others. And the other stream has been our charismatic and Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Not all of them, certainly some of the charismatic and Pentecostal denominations uh, do not do that, but, but, but some do. What's interesting to me as I've been thinking about it over the last uh, couple months is that only one of those two groups went fully astray. If you were like me, you watched the closing of the gathering of the United Methodist Church and mourned by the foolishness and the ridiculousness and the things that were sinful that were celebrated is okay. I did. I don't want to go there. And so I think it's worth asking, what is the difference between this, these bodies and the bodies that also made the same decision but did not nearly get to the destination Uh, that that the other group did. The Pentecostal and charismatic churches, when they went forward with the ordination of women, made their case, argued from the Bible. They pointed to particular Bible passages, most notably the passage that Paul, where Paul says there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither free nor slave, neither male nor female. I I come from a different uh, understanding of of that passage. I think there's other passages that need to speak into it other than just that one. But I think it's very notable and noble that these churches pointed first and foremost to the Bible. By and large, and I know that there are exceptions, but the exceptions are so rare they're hardly worth mentioning. In the mainline denominations, the appeal for the ordination of women was not to Holy Scripture, it was to the culture. It was to cultural categories of equality. 
This largely took place in the middle of cultural upheaval of the 60s and the 70s, in which we were wrestling as a, as a culture, and rightly so, with the, the, the way that w women had not been fully able to access life and society and rights and, 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 and roles and things like that. And this was an important conversation that the West needed to have. But the appeal was not to biblical authority. The appeal was to cultural authority. I think that's why these same churches who learned to appeal to cultural authority rather than to biblical authority are now appealing to cultural authority on much more uh, uh, problematic issues. For example, the ordination of acting and practicing homosexuals. And those who believe that God created them in the wrong bodies. We were not saved for escape. We were not saved for accommodation. This is that second part. Father, do not take them out of the world, Jesus prayed. Protect them from the evil one. Somehow it's both. As we move forward and wrestle with some of the issues that challenge us from within, like the ordination of, of, of women, how we understand church leadership and structure, what we think of tradition, hierarchy, obedience to holy orders, all the things that make us distinctly Anglican. May I make an appeal, brothers and sisters, that our authority is in Christ, who has expressed that authority in his holy word, not in the categories and the definitions and the framing that our culture gives. If our salvation is not for escape and our salvation is not for accommodation, what is our salvation for? One of the benefits of being raised in the Christian home and the Christian church that I was raised in is that uh, I went to Awana. Some of you know Awana. I not only went to Awana, I went to a Christian school. You know what that means? I memorized almost the entire Bible, verse by verse. <laughs> In the King James. That's true. When I graduated from kindergarten, I knew a verse for every letter in the alphabet. Even Q, quit you like men be strong. I still remember it to this day. The problem is now I read out of the ESV, and so when I try to quote scripture, it becomes this amalgamation of KJV and ESV, and we already have too many acronyms in Christianity to know what even that is. Um, uh, but, but here's the verse, if you grew up in that sort of background, that you absolutely would have memorized. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's one of the places where Paul articulates salvation in one of the most clear verses that you could, you know, it, it's just straightforward. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Praise God. The old has passed. Behold, See, this is where I mix up the, see, in the King James, it's all, the, old, the oldest past and all things have become new. That's how I learned it. Now, here's the wonderful thing about 2 Corinthians 5, 17, is that it tells us what salvation is. The other great thing about 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is that it comes immediately before 2 Corinthians 5, 18. I know that's deep. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us what salvation is. 2 Corinthians 5.18 tells us what salvation is for. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.18 is quickly followed by 2 Corinthians 5. There we go. And 18 and 19 are almost a word-for-word -word repetition of each other. And we all know when Paul repeats himself, he wants you to pay pretty close attention. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, the old is past, the new has come. Verse 18, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself and has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, verse 19, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them and has committed to us the ministry of? What is our salvation for? To fulfill the mission that Jesus prayed for us in John chapter 17, that we would have life and by having life, we would point to the one who gave us life. 
and that would glorify the Son, and that would glorify the Father, and that would fulfill God's eternal purposes. The purpose of the church is to fulfill God's eternal purposes. There's no other purpose. And this is precisely the language that Paul uses, that if you have been reconciled, you have been given the task of reconciliation. A reconciled one is called to be a reconciler. We will not fulfill that ministry of reconciliation if we have a posture of escape or a posture of accommodation. To close, I'd, I'd, I'd like to if you would pray with me a prayer for unity from the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech thee for thy holy Catholic Church that thou would be pleased to fill it with all truth in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of him who died and rose again and ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus Christ, thy son, our Lord. Amen.